host Eric Scopel and Robbie Boydston here. Uh, first off, I want to give a shout out to uh, Mario Gadini and Major Oni of Heavy Heaters for the new beats. Sick beats, guys. Loving it, loving it. That's uh, that's a catchy beat. That's a catchy beat. I th- we will be using these guys' beats for the foreseeable future. Thanks, guys. Great work. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that I mean, we were kind of discussing this, but now that we've got enough music kind of... Uh, official music sponsor, I guess. Yeah, I official say. music sponsor of the Duck <laughs> Podcast, Heavy Heaters. Thank you guys, great work. I uh, actually use the same uh, program as we're using for uh, for our podcast right now, so can't, yeah, can't imagine how you could do that. It's it's been so difficult for us to even get the audio working. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're learning. So we're, we're learning. learning. <laughs> anyway, uh, E Duck Podcast today. It's you know we're uh, 17 weeks until the until the season opener with Nickel State. Can't believe we're that close. Start your countdown. <laughs> 119 days actually. Yes. Uh, this is uh, and oh and we should say we're live from a different location. Yes. We're in Portland this week. We were up in Portland here with uh, at the uh, Shea Robbie. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Look at my spacious apartment. <laughs> Uh, got a lot of things to talk about, though, even though we are 17 weeks out. Yeah, uh, no shortage of uh, some things, especially since, you know, sports at you are kind of winding down yeah. now, heading into the home stretch before our summer, and, you know, there's still no shortage of things to talk which about. Is, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah. Of course, we, got a, we have an exclusive uh, interview here with Oregon's uh, most recent football commit, which we will be playing... Sometime, Sometime in the foreseeable future. I can't tell you when exactly because we're not that planned out. But we'll get to it. We'll, we'll get to it. When and, we get to recruiting, we'll, we'll definitely be playing that interview for you. You'll you'll love hearing it. Morgan Mihalik, uh, Oregon's uh, possible QB of the future. Um, and we'll, again, sure. we'll get into that a little later. But uh, good interview with him, and uh, it's always good to kind of get in contact with these guys. And we'd like to. I'd like to thank him at a time for allowing us to play the interview yeah, on the podcast. I'm not sure how how many guys will let us do this, but it. You know, allowing us to use the the interview on the podcast is a special thanks to to Morgan. If he's listening, thanks a lot and congrats on the on the commitment. Yeah, I do want to start off. And these things have so so little meaning except for things like this. But since we are now 17 weeks out, first uh, at least the first one I've seen since recently, uh, first top 25 done by ESPN's Mark Schleybaugh. Yeah, has Oregon number three. Interesting choice. Um. Interesting choice for Oregon three, or just in terms of the just the overall breakdown. I can I'll, I'll read you the top ten right now. Yeah, we do let's that? do that. I've got Ohio State number one, which I think maybe is what you're talking about. Is interesting. They were undefeated last year. Obviously, the bull ban stopped them from competing for a national championship. Speaking of the national champion, Alabama number two. That's where it gets tricky for me. Uh, you have Ohio hard- State twelve and zero last year. You can't discount that. That was great, especially you know having given what has happened with them with the sure. the sanctions and and that whole mess with Tressel and Terrell Pryor, for them to bounce back. You know, Urban Meyer that proves it's just impre- how great it's of a impressive. Coach he is. It's impressive when you're when you're playing essentially for for nothing. I you know in terms of postseason, right? I mean that that's tough to do. Oh yeah, and and that's something that and. and Remember a couple of years ago when USC kind of took on that same mantra of, you know, us against the world. We're not actually playing for anything. And, and think, they, they came into Oregon, beat them, ruined a national championship hope for them. Uh, finished, I think, was, what, 10-2, 10, and two, 10 or 11-2 and two or something some, like that. Or, yeah, some, well, I guess 10-2 because they didn't have they a bowl game. They wouldn't but, have any posts. Um, but, you know, they had that kind of mentality. And Ohio State kind of took that and went even further. Sure. And, and, again, you know, I got to give, uh, you know, so much credit to Urban Meyer there. Just he's such a great coach to be able to bring that out of the team. Sure, um, but it, it, there's something weird here, and I'm not trying to defend the SEC because I'm just as sick as everyone well, else they have, them well, winning and, the and title. If, but if we run through, they have five of the top eleven, so they've got they're getting enough respect there. That's true, but uh, there's something about you know Ohio State historically. I mean, yeah, they had they had the national title against Miami here sure. about about a decade ago. Even that I think was it was a, 11 years ago, wasn't it? 2002. Yeah, yeah, and they, I mean they beat Ken Dorsey's uh, Miami team, and even that game was a little bit you know controversial. Well, there was, given yeah, pass the, interference, pass interference call, of call. So Dan but, Fouts didn't agree with the call. Yeah, <laughs> Oregon great Dan Fouts, and. Um, what gets me about this ranking here is yes, twelve and zero is great, and you know they they can claim to be undefeated. Alabama can't. You know they had that loss at home to Texas A and M. But A and M, by the way, is sixth on the rankings, which I think is strong for them, and uh, that speaks to a how much hype uh, Mr. Manziel Johnny getting. Football, Johnny Football, <laughs> and then also I mean again, got to give credit to Kevin Sumlin coming in there and just turning things around quickly, quickly, very quickly. I mean they. They were a force to be reckoned with last year, and the way they handled Oklahoma in the Cotton Bowl was was very impressive. But with Ohio State, you know, 
the, the consensus is, is usually if you're you're number one at the beginning of the season or in these early preseason mm-hmm, rankings, sure. yeah, you look good in the spring, you look good in camp and everything, but you got to prove that you know throughout the twelve weeks in the season. And odds are you're not going to be staying there. So maybe this is just an evaluation of how they look in the spring, all that. Because I'm not sold on Ohio State being number one. I thought they were a top five team for sure. I thought if anything, when I was kind of going over after the season ended. Uh, going through those rankings in my head, I thought Ohio State was going to be the team that kind of kept Oregon out of the top five, that they would put Stanford up there uh, instead of Oregon. Stanford, and, at, Stanford at five. And Stanford's at five. So, again, you know, both those teams are having strong springs. Uh, I think Stanford's going to get hurt a little bit. I think they are hurt a little bit because, you know, they have guys like Stephon Taylor's gone, uh, Zach Step Hurts fan. is gone, Step Fan. And uh, <laughs> so those those guys are gone, and those, those were key pieces to that team. Yeah. Uh, but, again, if it were me – I would have Alabama at number one because, let's face it. Don't you have a hard time it, not it, having the, the champion of three of the last four BCS championships at number one heading yeah. into the season with a fair amount of returning players? I mean, I, I, I haven't looked all the way down their depth chart, but I know they've got their quarterback back, and I know they've got a large part of that defense back, and it seems like they can find someone to run the ball. I think TJ Yeldon's probably the guy this year. Yeah. But it's it, you just – but they, I'm, I'm, they, I'm they you. won't I'm little, reload. I mean, I'm a little surprised. I mean, they, they finish in the top three recruiting every single season. You know there's talent there. Oh, yeah, and they wrap up. I mean, and they have tons of recruits early on in the process sure. because of just who they are. And so, I, again, I uh, Crimson Tide I would put as my number one. Ohio State I would put in my top five. I would probably have them at, at two or three, something like that. Um, the, the strong thing, uh, the, the big thing for Oregon fans is, is that Schlaubach ha- does have Oregon at number three. Sure. Uh, he's, you know, obviously they're a little banged up right now with, with certain players. I mean, D'Anthony didn't play in the spring game last week. Didn't run track the last two meets either, which we, we will talk about track later on. Right. And, and so, but there were positive signs coming out of that spring game. We talked a lot about it last week, and I do think Oregon is worthy of being a top three team. The fact of the matter is, is that puts a lot of pressure on guys like Marcus Mariota and guys like D'Anthony to keep them up there the entire season. And we all know it any given Saturday, you know, it's a cliche term, but anything can happen yeah. and will happen. Sure. And Oregon was favored going into that game against Stanford and Ugh. looked completely different than they had the, the previous, previous nine weeks or whatever it was. Yeah. Right. So I, I believe that it's – it's almost better to kind of sneak up on everybody than to be that that high because I feel like at some point you're going to play a very, very uh, tight game, and there some team's going to take you out of your element mentally that's going to translate to how you play physically on the field. The, conversely, though, and, and these aren't obviously the AP rankings and aren't involved at all with the BCS rankings, but starting at the top, if you do go undefeated, if Ohio State, Alabama, and Oregon all were to go undefeated, and, that, and this was the order they were to start at, you know, Ohio State 1, Alabama 2, Oregon 3, Oregon's probably left out. Oh, yeah. You have, hard, you, have, you have a hard time jumping people just if, if, if no one loses a game. Exactly. And not only that, Oregon's still going to have that little bit of a stigma of being the gimmick. Ohio State tradition, Alabama tradition. Even though Ohio State is, is running a, is in, 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 under Urban Meyer, is trying to run a similar offense as to what Oregon – Oregon is running. I know Urban Meyer spent some time this this past winter with Chip Kelly up here in Eugene. Uh, learning. I'm not sure exactly what those discussions were about. I'm assuming a lot of it was just how they play the game and trying to. Add, but but that was something that happens. So. Oh yeah, but it, it's Oregon doesn't have the deep tradition that uh, Alabama or Ohio State does, and I think that. You know, when it comes down to it, a lot of it is the human influence. Two thirds of that formula is sure. influenced by the humans and their perception. And well, soon to, Ohio soon State to be usually 100%. gets the benefit of the doubt. So, soon to be, and soon to be, one hundred percent of it will be the the human element as we move forward towards a playoff system with a selection committee. And that's going to be scary uh, because, again, you know, we've seen how the human elephant uh, – the, the element um, – Could be an elephant, too. Elephant, yeah. <laughs> I got. I, I think I'm going to the zoo later today. I think that's why I got uh, animals on my mind. But, um, or we're talking about Alabama, too. Right. <laughs> but the – the, the, the thing is, is that the human perception, I mean, they brought the BCS in because they didn't think they, they biased voting system, and sure. yet it didn't exactly fix a ton. And now we're kind of going into this playoff system, which is great, 
And once that well, goes into effect, Oregon's going to – they wouldn't be a team well, left out. Because isn't it interesting if, if, if the concern was the bias of the, of, of the system here that we move towards – first we move towards a system but still 67% of it is human and now we're moving to an element where it's 100% human. Mm-hmm. Is it, I mean, isn't that – doesn't that seem like we're not fixing the problem? That I, and of course, this it is, seems this, like we're exacerbating the problem because if, we're going to – oh, cool. Now I can vote. You, know, it, you can't tell me that some of these writers out there don't have biases. We all grow – up sports fans rooting for specific teams you want to see your team get somewhere yeah. and you know it, it's just the, you see more often than not these teams that you know there's one or two teams every week you open up the paper and you look at the top 25 and go that they're not that good <laughs> and it's just like you know that it's just a, a perception by you know a certain amount of, of voters that well and it's just it's it's, it's often records based as yeah. well and, and they and, don't really consider it i mean a lot of the voters i don't think consider strength of schedule at least early on it's a team, you know, I think Mississippi State last year went undefeated in the first seven games, ended up like seven and five, and were in the top ten at one point. Yeah, and I think the coaches vote is just a joke because, I mean, those guys, those they're not have, watching they, they games they, on Saturdays. They so. wouldn't be very good coaches if they were watching everybody play, would they? No, exactly. They, Oregon wouldn't be a top five team if Chip Kelly would have been sitting well, he there. Admitted, I don't, he, and he even admitted he doesn't, he doesn't vote on these things. So Exactly, so... It's one of those things where there's always going to be some bias to it. Obviously, it's really fun to analyze these these this, rankings. This, this is, I mean, look at the look only... who's behind Oregon. Louisville's well, at number four. Let's yeah, well, well, let's run down the rest of it. Well, you just touched on it. Louisville's number four. Stanford five. Texas M six. And then we get a slew of, of SEC teams. Georgia seven. South Carolina eight. Michigan jumps in at nine, which I don't understand why Michigan's that high. We can talk about that if you want. Nah. Uh, and then we've got Notre Dame at ten and, and Florida at eleven. Uh, yeah, I feel like there's going, there's going to be a couple of those teams that are going to get exposed early on. Um, well, the SEC, I, I feel like, will we'll always – I mean, five of the top 11 from the SEC, I think it's six of 16. Well, what was it? Georgia is opening up against, I believe, Clemson and South Carolina. So they're taking both South Carolina schools on and, early and, on. And Clemson, I think, is also – So that's going to knock some teams out right away. Yeah, Clemson's at 12. So, I mean, there's going to be some – some excitement early on in the season. That's kind of fun. It's 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 actually surprising somewhat to see these well, and what SEC stands out teams to me- playing difficult competition in the non-conference. Oh, yeah, and that's great, finally. I would like to see them go on the road and do this a lot more often. <laughs> Tennessee is coming to Oregon, right? Yeah. That, well, of course, yeah, Tennessee see- not on this top 25. <laughs> but they're stepping up. <laughs> not surprisingly, not on this top 25 list. What surprises me, the, these two, 16 and 17, are the one that surprised 16, me. 16 and 17? LSU, yep. Oklahoma. Yep. It's a little low. Very low for, for, for schools that are traditionally top five, top ten schools every season. I've seen Oklahoma drop bowl game after bowl game, and the next year they're still top five yeah. getting into the season. You know, nothing against big game Bob out there in, in Norman, but, uh, it you know, they don't win. Usually they are very bad in, in bowl games. Um, their last BCS win came against UConn, who I believe went in going eight and four, unranked, had never been to a BCS game, and they played in front of a half full stadium. In, in, okay, yeah, uh, because the Big Phoenix. East deserves to have a BCS, you know, bowl bit every year, don't they? Yeah. Well, yeah, we can we can get into that another time. <laughs> we've, we've got <laughs> 17 another... weeks until the season starts. I think we can devote an episode to uh, we'll definitely to that do entirely. That. We can we can just talk for the Big East for an episode. That'll really. Fit in with fit in with our viewers, I'm sure. Oh yeah, our listeners, I should say. Well, we can expand the horizons. There we, we, go. we should we should talk about every region. Uh, Stacking with the Pac-12 now. Now we've got UCLA at 19 and USC at 23. Thoughts on just the overall way the conference is received here by by Schleybach. I think Oregon this at is three, a good thing. Stanford at five, UCLA at 19, USC at 23. A little surprised to see USC in the poll, frankly. A little surprised UCLA is that low given the way they finished off last season and given the way that USC finished off last season, to see them only four apart is a bit surprising, I think. Well, and USC is one of those, they're the one West Coast team that seems to always get the benefit of the doubt by name. And I think part of the reason why they're up here like this is, you know, they do get, you look at their recruiting classes every year, even when they had the only sanctions. signed 12 guys, but, but they're, they're all, all five-star five star guys. So <laughs> that's that's the thing is they're always, they're, they're they're reloading every year. They're not having to rebuild. They've got these talented kids that they just got to get to learn their system. And, you know, you see when they're successful and they're gelling and there's not, you know, bad team chemistry like there was last season, they're that 10-2 team. Yeah. Uh, when 
the ego starts setting in, uh, you know, infighting starts happening. Then you see the seven and six team from last year. So I think a lot of this is the perception of, okay, they're going to corral, you know, they're going to, they're going to end up building on the chemistry. They're going to try and improve the team chemistry. I think USC will at some point show that they are worthy of this ranking probably early on. Uh, what's going to be interesting is when they, they play some of those bigger games. Cause there's, there's some PAC 12 teams that aren't listed on here that, that have the potential to be dangerous. And again, you know, these aren't official. It no. could be completely different when it, when it comes out. It, it, will, I like, it, will, it will be. I mean, this is, this is, this is one media member out of whatever it is, 200 and something members that typically vote on the polls. So right. it's a very fine view, but, and I like UCLA at, at 19. Um, I think, I think you, I, I, I like UCLA it for them. Higher. I think they, they could be higher, but what I like if you're a UCLA fan is, okay, now you've got a little bit of that disrespect right there. It seems a little motivation. Yeah. And that you're going to play with a little bit more of a chip on your shoulder. Mora already coaches like that. He's a very aggressive coach and really doesn't, doesn't seem to give a, a crap really about what be selected what he, there. What, yeah. <laughs> trying to choose my words uh, correctly, but he, he, uh, he, he's a, he's a great coach. He's an aggressive coach. Uh, no nonsense. It seems, I guess is the best word to use for is no sure. nonsense. And, uh, yeah. he's going to use this as motivation for and UCLA. I, and I think Brett Hundley is going to really come out of this next year. I, I, bl- I believe so too. You know, all the talent in the world there. And, and I think, I think that this conference is, is really developing a lot of good quarterback talent. Yeah, and and part of the I've, reason might be for UCLA's low ranking again. Uh, Jonathan Franklin leaving, but they've uh, got so many like four and five star running backs in that roster. But UCLA doesn't have that history of of you know staying sustaining a ranking, and so I think again that true history does play into these rankings. Um, They're the uh, South yeah. Division champion the last, last two years in the Pac-12. Oh yeah, oh man. I, I always uh, that the first <laughs> one, of course. I think they finished like six and six in New Heights was fire. Before the before game, before the bowl game, but give him credit for coaching that one out. <laughs> but, uh, and now, 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 kind of sticking with this this preseason seventeen week out ranking, if you will. Here, I've also found and credit to someone a poster on open season here uh, for posting the oddshark dot com national championship odds, which I personally give a little bit more credence to because. There's obligation here for the for these people putting money on them in Vegas, you know. Yeah, yeah. There's they're, a little bit more on the line. There's a little bit more on the line, so they want to be accurate with these 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 uh these odds, or they're going to lose millions of dollars possibly. Ooh, <laughs> Ooh that got you excited. <laughs> yeah, millions, <Money. laughs> millions of dollars. Um, but I'll just break it down here. I'm not sure if you've you've seen these. So I this have might not be, yet. So this is going to be just initial reaction. Yeah, throw them at me. Okay, let's hear it. Alabama, who you thought should have been the number one team in the ESPN ranking, is the number one here on the Odd Shark, 13 to four. To okay. Win the national championship. So it gets complicated here, but I think that means it's like four and a quarter. Yeah, something like that. Right. Yeah. Once you break down fractions, I was never good with fractions. You have to divide 13 by four, and I think you get what it really means, right? To one. Yeah. Do you have to cross multiply at any point of that? <laughs> if you want, you can, man. I'll let you cross multiply all day. So, so Alabama, rightfully, in your opinion, they're at the top. Oregon, number two, 13 to two odds. So about six and a half. So you're getting the national title game that a lot of people did want to see last year. I think that's that's definitely a strong indicator of where the, they think those two teams are in terms of even, you know, Oregon losing their coach. Um you know, in Alabama, well, Alabama's just coming back reloading, but with Oregon well, losing their coach, I, they're putting them I, that I, I high. Think that says That's a, great. I think that says a lot about national perception. Yeah. That Oregon can go through a coaching change, something that I think in past years, if it would have happened, there would have been a question about well, where are they going to be? Are they going to be able to sustain this success? Mm-hmm. But to have them essentially where they left off last year, actually a little bit better. That's fantastic. Is, is, says a lot. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and again, that. Uh, the stability, the the program that they've built under uh, what that they build under Kelly and that Helfrich is carrying on, uh, like you said, it does speak volumes. And I think as they, it, as long as they keep continuing to do this, the perception is going to get, you know, they they are they like to brand themselves as kind of anti tradition, but they're going to be viewed as this kind of traditional power. So that's that's kind of cool. That's never really happened at Oregon. No, not at all. No, it's it is it is cool to see them up here near the top. And these, and I think, granted, but we've said it. Can't say how many times you said it. This is 17 weeks out and has no bearing on really anything at this point. But Nickel State certainly. is putting this on their bulletin. Board. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're putting these odds on the bulletin board. They're putting, yeah, I'm sure they are. They got to watch the bad taste out of their mouth. They're letting Oregon State put 77 up on them. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's not good. Uh, br- finishing up here in the top five, we've got Ohio State seven to one, so nearly the same as Oregon. Mm-hmm. Texas A and M ten to one, Georgia fourteen to one, and then I've marked out the rest of the Pac twelve teams that they've got odds on. Stanford eighteen to one, so Stanford by far the best. And then the next, the next Pac twelve teams: UCLA and USC fifty to one. So if, hmm. if you're an LA guy and you feel pretty good, yeah, could, I would lay that, down fifty bucks that, on that. that. That could pay out a lot. Mm-hmm. No, it, and put USC in there. I mean, why not? Lay down fifty on USC and see what see happens. See if you can win twenty five hundred. It, it's going to be it, well. It's going to be one of those years where either they, you know, disaster like last season, or they might come out and shock some people. And it, college football, a lot of it's about momentum. And if if they can string some wins together, and you know, I don't. It, don't you think a lot of this has to do with whether or not the team buys into Kiffin this year? At yeah. this point, he's playing. He's, I think the team's kind of playing for his job at this point. Yeah, and I think that he needs to uh, – Pete Carroll, it seemed, had the respect of those guys at all times. and uh, But he had a much – he always seemed very welcoming, very open-armed. Uh, he, he bought he, – he was able to sell USC to these guys, sell the lifestyle, and make them feel comfortable coming in. And that's why he was able to kind of rebuild USC from the ashes out of the late 90s when they were – Sure. When they were tanking. Kiffin, it seems, has a little bit more of that. Uh, you know, he's got a little bit more of that ego, and it, it doesn't seem like he well, rela- relays that message is, as well. Isn't it interesting that we're one year removed from, you know, number one ranking preseason expectations? We're going to play for a national championship now. To let's just try to keep the job. Let's just let's just try not to lose my job this year. I mean, it, that, how far has he fallen in, in one year? It's pretty incredible if you think about it. It really is. But again, when you're at a big name school like that, I mean, if Bob Stoops came out next year and Oklahoma went five and six, it doesn't matter that he's built up all that goodwill. He won a national title there. There's going to be people at Oklahoma going, what's that about? What? You know, you just, you just look at Auburn, Gene Chizik. Exactly. No. And, and, and Three years removed from a national championship, loses his job, right? Yeah. And, I mean, remember the first game coming out of that national championship, they had to have a miracle comeback against Utah, Utah State, State at home. I remember that. So, to yeah. just survive. And so you knew that a lot of that team was carried by not only Malzahn's offense, but that, uh, you know, that one guy that named one Cam guy Newton. Was, he, was pretty, <laughs> he, was, he was pretty good. Yeah. Uh, moving down the list here, actually, they, they, they really – Rank these out here. They've got a lot here. We've got Oregon State's 101 odds, so Beaver fans can can really make some money if they want to. I might even lay down some money on that. Put five dollars on it. You could win some money. I don't know. Exactly. Washington's 100 to one, and then Arizona and Cal both 200 to one. Well, okay, yeah. I'm I mean, probably not laying any money down on Cal. You're not going to put. You're not going to put put a dollar down on Cal, and you can win 200 dollars. <laughs> it's very very low risk, very high reward potentially. Well, Sonny Dykes, uh, that would be a heck of a first year for him, um, and <laughs> for I would send him a thank you letter for that. <laughs> but no, I, I think it, with Oregon being that high, that's fantastic. Stanford being up there is is very good. The one that puzzles me a little bit, and this is just because watching them over the years, they yeah, you know, every once in a while they'll pull off the big game, but uh, more often than not, it seems they don't. Is Georgia. And Georgia, especially playing in a tough SEC, there's still yeah. going to be a lot of tough teams there. They, you know, it's nice they play in the East uh, as opposed to the West. Which I mean, it, it does switch off. You know, which which side is is tougher? A, a little bit. I think it's been pretty consistent though the last four or five years here. But you know, Georgia, I think they they put together a great year last year, and that was fantastic. But I just don't see them running through the SEC. They're gonna, if they do. I think- I think part of it fantastic, is fantastic, but I don't, just don't see I think it. part of it is is that most folks assume that they'll be representing that side in the SEC championship game. But and, an SEC, you got and, Florida. and the winner of the SEC championship yeah. probably goes to the national championship just about every year. That's true, and I mean they they came close. I mean they were what eight yards short or something like that. You know, an yeah, unfortunate tip pass yeah. and catch against Bama, but and they played great again. You know, Aaron Murray looked fantastic, especially on that last drive. He 
he showed some poise, and I, I was very impressed by I, the way he did. Don't you he, think he's he part of the way, reason that they're so high? I do. I do, and him coming back is huge. Uh, I was actually very happy to hear that because I'm a fan of the guys who come back and, and kind of make college football a little bit more interesting because you see so many rookie quarterbacks. Sure, this I, year was, was different for the NFL, but there's a lot of times where the rookie come, quarterbacks come in. and you know, look at Aren't, you, aren't you a fan, though, of maybe the SEC falling from grace? Do you really want all their good players to come back? Don't you want them all to go pro when they're left with the scrubs? Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, isn't there, time, isn't there a part of you a little bit? There's a there's the part of me, but there's the part of me that wants to see the SEC taken down. The difference is is that you can't claim to dethrone the SEC unless you beat them, and I want to see a team take them down in the title game. It's almost a foregone conclusion now every year that the SEC seven, champion seven is going to years. is going to end up in the title game. It's just what's that team that's going to face them? I want to see that team take them down, regardless of who that is. Well, okay, not Ohio State. Don't want to see Ohio State do it, but regardless of whoever else out there, I do want to see. I think there's one team in particular in you like. Game. There's one team in particular you wouldn't mind seeing there. I think maybe, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it, and that would be nice to see you know Oregon in there. But if it was. You know, USC, if it was Texas, if it was Oklahoma, I mean, and granted, Oklahoma, Oregon, those guys have already had their shots uh, and not, not been able to capitalize. But again, Texas, too. And, and Texas, too. Yeah. And unfortunately, you know, Cole McCoy going down. Um, but it, it, there's something about beating the SEC and doing it on the grandest stage that makes it a little bit more special. Uh, and that's just, you know, that's my opinion about it. So. As much fun as it was talking about these things that don't really matter, let's talk about something that okay. kind, of, kind of matters, I guess, uh, and, and maybe it doesn't to some Oregon fans who – I know there's that old adage, once a duck, always a duck. Mm-hmm. Cliff Harris, former duck. Oh, Cliff. Yeah, you're shaking your head. Uh, I think when you see a player waived from the team five months before the season starts, like three months before training camp, you usually assume something bad happened that probably didn't involve play on the field. It, I give him this. At least he wasn't driving this time at a high rate of speed <laughs> with, you know, with what ducks in the car. What if he was driving at a slow rate of speed with ducks in the car? Oh no, 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 no! You, you don't, <laughs> no, you don't want to be driving, especially if you're taking part in said activity that he was taking part in. Um, said activity being marijuana possession was arrested, yes. which led to the wave. Yes, and again, this is just come on, think with your head. Uh, you. This is a guy who had tons of talent, showed how much talent, showed that he could be a game changer at Oregon. Uh, remember One the year. Cal game? Mm-hmm. Uh, the Cal game, that big punt, punt return, return touchdown. Saved him an opportunity for a national championship, yeah. Exactly. And he made a big impact on the title game. Uh, he got robbed of a, a Interception out of bounds, that's what I thought was... That looked into me, but um, at the same time, yeah, 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 he yeah. was... He, he was a game changer, and he was able. He had a lot of confidence in himself, which you want to see almost a little bit too much. But he was able to translate that into good plays on the field. There were a few bonehead plays given, you know. But Colorado comes to mind. The, the safety, I think that was Colorado's only two points of the game, was a Cliff Harris safety on a punt return. He ran back into the end zone, <laughs> yeah. reversed field, got tackled. Uh, that was kind of the equivalent. It was probably like a heat check in basketball, where you're just anywhere on the court, you know. I just let it fly, see what happens. Um, he had those moments, and you know, even you know, it seemed like he would. There were there were times where he would, you know, on a punt return, he would run really fast at the ball, and the ball would almost shoot over his head, uh, which I found weird. But I went to his when they had the pro day at mm-hmm. Oregon. I remember watching him, and I don't know if he was a little out of shape or anything. He did, you know, he was kind of a little a little sick um, at his pro day, but he looked, you know, he had the skills. He didn't look like he had lost too much of anything, even though he hadn't really played in a year. And there was hope that, okay, he made his mistakes in college, hopefully he turns it around. And Cliff Harris is now becoming, now that he's been away for another stupid, stupid decision on his part, if I'm Tyran Matthew, I'm looking at Cliff Harris and going, sure. I don't want to become him, because the, the signs are there. And Cliff Harris, again, all the talent in the world, but didn't have, you know, and I, I'm sorry this sounds harsh, but doesn't have the brain to back it up. I and think it's safe to say this is the last chapter in the, the tragic story of Cliff Harris, at least as a football player. Yeah, I think I, so, too. I mean, I don't think many teams are, 
are really going to be taking a waiver on him now after he was just waived. Maybe Canada. Maybe Canada. Yeah. Maybe up in the CFL. Yeah, I don't know. It, but it's just it's it's it's, it's sad. There. It's it's, <laughs> it's 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 one. And someone posted this if, uh, that uh, maybe if he was playing for the Broncos or for the Seahawks, it wouldn't have been. <laughs> yeah, a swept problem. under the rug. No, I, I, just I because it's legal in those states now. Yeah, R- right. Yeah, and you know. It, <sighs> Again, it just it stinks to see a guy with all the talent, regardless of if he's a duck or not. The guy had talent, and the guy had the confidence to go out there and pull off some pretty impressive things and had the, the potential to do it, and you just decided to throw it away. And when you're given that kind of an opportunity, that's something you don't want to flush away, and that's something that it seems like a lot of athletes yeah. don't keep in the back of their mind. They take it for granted, and... This is what can happen. I think sustained stupidity is the is the term here, really. I, mean, I agree. Just, yeah. just never figured it out. No. And it's and it is, it is sad. Yeah. Um, you saw, I mean, really, really only kind of a one year wonder mm-hmm. because his freshman year he was just you know kind of getting acclimated to the game. Sophomore year had that breakout season. I think three punt returns for a touchdown, four or five interceptions. Yeah. Junior year was well ended because he was dismissed from the program. But if you're going to do – I mean, look, it's, if you're going to do that kind of an activity, go do it at home. Go do it where you're you know not going to get bust. Be smart about it. I'm not advocating it. I'm just saying go – Be smart about doing your illegal activities. Exactly. You know? And well, it, let's take it a step further. Maybe we yeah. don't do the illegal activities. That's the first step. That but the, if he's going to have to do it – That's smartest. <laughs> yes. But it, it just seemed like that wasn't going to be an option. So, I, yeah. again, he, he could have been a lot smarter just by not doing it. Um, and then a lot, even more, you know, it would have been a lot smarter to just, if you're going to do it, do it at home. Do it not where you're going to get caught in public. Um, and then, you know, your cost. Now, what are you going to go do? What, what's I never, next I, for I never, Cliff Harris? I never understand why people carry those things around when they're just wandering. I don't know either. That seems. It's like, not something just like lock in your closet or something like that and then bring out when you want to bring it out uh, probably i, I, I don't speak know from someone who doesn't partake in such activities right yeah no i i don't know it's just that it just seems like if you're going to be smart about it and you know hey i i went to college i knew people who did that kind of thing and it was just you know they did it they weren't out in the middle of the street or in the middle of you know in a car <laughs> in the middle of the street you know doing that's that going 118 miles per hour yeah and then claiming oh we we smoked it all, you know. <laughs> that is a good excuse. That's that. That usually works. Well, it got him out of pos- uh, possession, apparently. So, I mean, <laughs> uh, technically, it was smart, even though it turned into kind of an immortalized phrase. It, you know, like the. It was know, the name of my fantasy football team that year. It <laughs> <laughs> smoked it all. That's fantastic. Oh yeah. Well, and that's that. You know, and that's Cliff Harris. You know, I'm sure if he came back to Oregon and if Oregon would let him, you know, be a captain or something, which I doubt happens right now, but I'm sure he would get a roused applause, rousing applause from you know, the, you think at least so? the, the student well, from the student section. I think maybe so. from the student section. I, 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 I think it would be mixed. I think there are a lot of people who were put off by everything. Yeah, I think a lot of people got sick of his his uh, tactics, at, especially by the time he got dismissed from the team. Well, anytime you see someone who has potential to be a first-round draft pick dismissed, I don't think that sits well. And that's why I say always a duck. Once a duck, always a duck. I don't know if that sits well with some people right now. But to some other, you know, to some of the college contingent, they're going to think this is kind of a funny and try to try to immortalize him for, you know, ho, 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 Cliff Harris, you know. I guess. I, I don't know. I just I, – I, I've seen those types of people. I've, I've, <laughs> if you go into the student section you, at, at, at Oregon, there's <laughs> certain things you see in here that you don't see or hear in the other parts of the stadium, I guess. That's probably fair. Yep. All right. So – Want to talk some recruiting? Let's do that. Let's get into recruiting. We had a – quite had a busy a, week. We did have a busy week. We got uh, – Oregon picked up the third commitment. You can talk about that, obviously, as you are the recruiting – Guru, Kent if you will. Field, California's own Morgan Mahalik. And I believe it's Mahalik. It might be Mahalik. I, when I talked to his dad, he didn't correct me when I said Mahalik. So we I'm were talking about Mahalik. that, but some people are funny and just don't correct you. Exactly. Yeah, they're just Which being is nice. now going to be really embarrassing when you mispronounce his name. And I apologize ahead of time. Uh, <laughs> I'll get, we'll, I'll get we'll, a phonetic We'll run a retraction on. next week if we need to. Yeah. Let's just say that. We'll, yeah, we will. Did we ever find anything about Najili? Is that... I think it's Nigel. I think that's how you say did, it. Did someone correct you on that? No. But I've been looking up phonetic pronunciations because Oregon had another uh, no. offer out this week to a kid that I legitimately had to ask for a phonetic pronunciation of it. I didn't really get it. But And who was that? 
I got it here, Leith. I believe that's right. And then his last name, F-R-I-E-K-H. I believe it's Freak. Leith oh, Freak. I think his last name is Freak, based on how it's wow. spelled. That which is fantastic. Does he play defensive end? Because that seems like a... Offensive tackle. Yeah, it works. But he is... Watch his tape. He's very good. Uh, very very physical. Um, 6'5", 255. Uh Gonna be, gonna... Good pull blocker, actually. Hmm. And, um, you know, he, he plays left tackle in his system, looks like. But he's – and he's got – Well, it sounds like, sounds like, the, sounds, like the, well. sounds like a frame of a guy who would probably play something similar to Oregon. Yeah. I mean, and you look at good movement too. John Stone and Andre Y, because I don't know how to pronounce the last name. Speaking of names, are hard to say. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we had a good discussion about that. Uh, uh, those guys both came in. Mm-hmm. 250, 260. Yeah, and and uh, obviously if, if if he does choose Oregon, obviously it's just an offer. But I mean, he would come in probably a little bit heavier after his senior year. You probably look in 265, 270 or something. But um, but okay. Anyway, back get, to let's Mah- get Mah- back. Mah- let's Mah- get back yeah. to the, the man who committed so, to Oregon. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get back to the guy who's actually going to be on the team. Um, Morgan Mahalik, uh, Kenfield, California, mm-hmm. six foot three, one hundred ninety pounds. Is what he's listed at. You see a lot of comparisons to Marcus Mariota. You saw, you, you hear about that earlier in the week. Uh, yeah. I know from reading Brandon Huffman our, uh, at Scout's own Brandon Huffman, sure. national analyst, wrote a, a nice little analyst of, analysis. Uh, excuse me, of, an analyst of, analysis. Analyst analysis. <laughs> Good save um, about uh, about Morgan and basically made that the comparison. They both didn't start. Yeah. Uh, he he played a lot of wide receiver last year, um, but when he did get a chance to play, you know, when he did play quarterback, he looked great. Um, he's uh, he's going to be starting again this year, much like Mariota, who had to wait to start at his high school uh, in, in uh, Hawaii. Uh, they they said the difference was, and this is what what I found interesting was, other schools that he chose Oregon over include Oregon State, mm-hmm. and then you go Duke. USF, so South Florida, NC State, and then He's getting offers South from all over the place. But what strikes me is a kid that when you watch his tape, the the, the signs with the signs and comparisons to Mariota are accurate. You think he's, so? He's he's an extremely accurate passer. And the thing that stood out to me was, and I know Oregon doesn't do a ton of this, yeah, but he throws the deep ball very well. <laughs> he's very accurate on the deep ball. And he puts the ball exactly where the receivers need it, even if there's coverage. He doesn't panic when the pocket starts to collapse around him. Uh, does have good legs. Uh, does have good field vision. But his arm, he was very, very accurate and uh, very good at throwing it deep. What surprised me, though, is that these other schools, and Brandon touched on this in his article. He said that he didn't really do a lot of camps to put himself out there for those other schools to see. His quarterback ability, because obviously, you know, he didn't have a lot of tape to go back and send. So, Oregon almost, it seems like, kind of is getting a steal here. because Similar to Mariota, who... Uh, yeah, three stars. Oregon star. was really the first person to, or the first school to really recognize. And- right, and and what I find interesting there is, is that he... This is... The, the, depending on what happens with Marcus next season, if he's good enough... I mean, he is good enough, but if he has another stellar season and decides, okay, I want to go jump to the NFL, will Mahalik come in and be able to compete right away What's for that spot? I mean, he's going to be going against, you know, we talked about Jake Rodriguez, Jeff Lockie. Damian Hobbs. Damian Hobbs. But Mahalik is, is going to be the guy who is closest to what Oregon has right now. Sure. And he's healthy, granted, as long as he's healthy heading through his senior season. He says he, you know, and we'll play the interview here in a second, but yeah. he did say that, you know, he's trying to get in early. Uh, Which or you trying always to graduate, like to hear. You graduate always like early, to hear that, yeah. yeah. And so that's something that if he's out there by next spring and able to take a few reps in the spring game, do all that kind of thing, then all of a sudden, you know, do you transfer it to a true freshman? Who knows? Um, so it, it provides this little bit of uh, intrigue as to he's likely the quarterback of the future uh, based on – You think so? I, I think so, uh, just based on the tools. Now, granted, it could all change coming to college. I mean, Lake Seastrunk was a five-star running back who everyone thought was going to be great, and he came in and, you know, we all know how great next he year's at Oregon. He- next year's Heisman, though. Yep, but um, – 2013. Lay your money down on it. What's the odds on him? <laughs> him winning the Heisman? <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh. Um. But with Mahalik, uh, it's Oregon's going to be set at quarterback for a little bit, I believe. And this is a, a strong case. Now, granted, they could go out and get another kid 
uh, you know, there's are, nothing are, saying they could. But have, have, have you, did you get any understanding of whether or not they were looking to take more than one quarterback? Did you talk about that? As of right now, they're, it doesn't sound like they are. And okay. Uh, I th- As of right I'm, now, yeah. I'm thinking taking another quarterback might be contingent on what Marcus decides to do. Right, and we'll see that later on. I mean, because, again, we're still very five, early in the process. Five we're, quarterbacks is probably about where they want. Five scholarships quarterbacks, which is where they are right now if Mario to, Mario to comes back and Mahalik mm-hmm. sticks with his commitment. Right, and, again, yeah, depending on what. And I think Mahalik, it would be nice if he got a year, you know, just to kind of sit, understand the system like Marcus did. And, uh, yeah, it, 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 he's he's going to be a solid a player. In my opinion, he could be the quarterback of the future for Oregon just based on the tools that he has, the, the skill set that he has. And, uh, I mean, he's got good size. He'll probably add a little bit more weight on, I'm sure. And he's definitely made to run this system. If you watch his highlight tape, he, there's a lot of that similarity of running Oregon system just with a little bit more deep ball. With that ringing endorsement, let's go ahead and play the tape. Okay, so how did everything come about here? Was it an easy decision for you? Very easy, yeah. I, what uh, kind of went into the decision-making? Obviously, I mean, you got the offer very quickly. You know, you turned it around very yeah. quickly. Um, you know, no second thoughts <laughs> at all among uh, any of the other schools. And, and why was that? What what made Oregon that immediate go-to? Yeah. You know, they've been on me for a good amount of time here, and... Um, I knew for about the past month and a half, two months, that I was going to commit. They offered pretty quickly here. And, um, you know, Coach Ross has been completely honest with me throughout the whole process. And uh, as we got close, you know, I took, couple, took two visits in the last month and um, just knew that it was coming. And once it came, I just pulled the trigger. So. What have those conversations been like the last couple of months with Coach Frost um, to, to make you feel so secure in making your decision? You know, they just felt really comfortable with me being their guy, and um, I think as we kept talking, they felt more and more comfortable, and then they said, you know, we're going to come down to you throw, and that should be that, and, um, you know, they went back to us, started their off for me after they saw me throw. As long as Coach, Coach Ross said at, at dinner on Saturday, he said, as long as I don't piss on my leg, I'll have an offer, and, um, and I didn't piss on my leg, I did really well this morning, I had a great morning, and, and he, he offered up, so. Excellent. Um, so what's what's kind of the next steps? Um, you've been to Eugene, right? And and check yeah. that out. So, um, well, first off, let me ask how you enjoyed that. Love it. I love everything about it. It's a great place uh, to go to school, play football. And, um, I have family there, so it's just, it's just perfect for me in every phase. Has Frost talked to you about your strengths as a quarterback and how that's going to be implemented into the Oregon system? I mean, you're, you're on the cusp now of being a, a guy who – is being looked at as possibly taking over the program after, you know, Marcus Mariota leaves, because um, you'll be kind of on the cusp there. Absolutely. Yeah, they, um, they really compare you to Marcus a lot. Um, we're pretty similar in stature and, and our size. You know, we're about, he's about, I don't know, 200 probably, and we're both the same height. Um, and uh, we play the game the same way. You know, he's fast. He's probably a little quicker than me right now, but hopefully I'll be at, at his speed when I get to his age and, um, so they really like that about me is the, the comparison between me and Marcus, and um, I'm definitely excited to get up there um, after this year. Do you feel that's a fair comparison? And if so, how are you gonna? What are you going to do to try and uh, kind of elevate your game past that level? Yeah, it's totally fair. I mean, we, we even play quarterback during the year just like me, and, and we play but not as, not as much as the normal uh, guy would. Um, but uh, you know, I, I don't want to. Marcus is a great quarterback and a great guy to follow, but I, I don't want I just want to be myself um, and, and make my own path. But I think that path will look pretty similar to his. So. What have your interactions been with Oregon players thus far? Um, they're all super supportive, all really like me, and especially the quarterbacks. We have a good relationship now with those guys, and a couple of guys have reached out here and there. You know, um, Anthony and uh, Keenan Lowe a lot. Um, I have a, I have a, a, a former uh, player, teammate, Emory Catholic, who's on the team, is off the line, and Matt McFadden, and, uh, you know, they're all just, they're all super good guys, and I think when I took my visit, that was the one thing that stood out uh, the most, was they're the high-quality guys and high-character guys and guys that I want to surround myself with, so um, they're all great, and I'm, I'm lucky to be part of that group now. Excellent. Um, 
in terms of uh, just your style of play, what's a feature of your game that you feel is going to become uh, better noticed uh, by Oregon fans once they get to see you step out onto the field? Something that maybe you think is a little underrated in your opinion? Uh, I think arm strength. I think my arm is one of the strongest in the country, honestly. Um, I don't mean to sound boastful, but I think it's really, really strong right now and getting to get stronger. And then I think my speed can inspire a lot of people. Uh, it's very deceptive, kind of like Marcus is. So uh, those two things probably right there. Excellent. Um, any plans to now that you've been, you know, now that you ha- are committed, uh, what's what is the next step? Um, are you going to try to get up there early? Are you, uh, are are you gonna wait? You know, after the recruiting cycle, kind of finish up things normally and then go next fall. Um, do you know what your plan is uh, yet? We'll see. I, I would definitely like to uh, early enroll, but it all kind of depends on how things play out here. Um, <laughs> so we got some time to make that decision. Excuse <laughs> me. Um, and um, so we all see. It's definitely on my mind, though. Excellent. And then, what what do you see yourself doing with this system? Obviously, uh, you, you're a proponent of it. Uh, you've been compared to Marcus Mariota, who's who's done very well within the system. Um, how do you think you're going to uh, do within it? I think I'll do well. Um, I think it's, it's very similar to our system where we run, and so I'm kind of eager for that. And um, it's nice to you get know, a lot of time to sit back. Do you feel like you're going to be able to adapt quickly to that? Absolutely. It's very similar to what we do. That was Oregon's most recent commit, Morgan Mahalik, talking to Robbie earlier this week. Uh, sounds like a really confident guy. I think one thing I took away was that he uh, he said he thought he had one of the strongest arms in the country. I mean, that, that shows a little bit of... Uh, a little bit of confidence there. You gotta love that if you're an Oregon fan. Yeah, absolutely. you know this kid's gonna come in here and try and take over this offense. You can tell that he's definitely mentally prepared. Now yeah. it's different when you get, and this is the one thing I like to stress is when I talk to these athletes, a lot of them do realize, though they might run similar systems to Oregon, it's becoming more and more popular at the sure. high school level it's still nothing compared to the speed at which Oregon conducts the system. So they know, they say, look, I'm getting ready. I'm doing all these speed drills. I'm doing endurance drills. I'm building up my stamina. I'm doing whatever I can. But I know that when I get to Oregon, it's going to be different because they're going to kick your butt in in (laughs) practice and they're going to amp up the tempo. And so it's difficult to prepare, but if you've got the confidence and the mental mindset... Which, which I think he does. Exactly. And so that's a, a huge positive sign for, for Oregon fans. And I, I think that's going to be a... Uh, that's that's going to be a great thing to see uh, see him develop, and hopefully things work out for the best. Uh, yeah. Now that we're at... Oregon's at three, three verbal commits right now, and uh, all of them uh, seem pretty pretty strong. You get a sense of how big this class is going to be at all? Based on the tough, numbers tough of the question. last – yeah, it, it is. But based on the numbers of the last um, – taking the Chip Kelly sample size, it, it, you know, that's – Around they, 20. The, I think they had on average about 20, 21. Um, I think their yeah. best was 23. I think they went as low – I mean, last year was 19. Helfrich is more aggressive, though, and we touched on we this last about, yeah. week. And, and he's he's more aggressive. He's sending – you know, there, there seems to be uh, quite a few offers out – Around the country, they're they're attacking more of the Midwest right now. They've obviously attacked the Southeast a lot, and they're getting a few kids in the Northeast. But the Northeast isn't quite as strong of a recruiting area. That's more basketball country. Absolutely, yeah. And so, and and of course, they've they've done quite a bit of of uh, they've been very diligent in, in recruiting down the West Coast as of late. They, they've really kind of amped it up actually, and so I think that you know. If I had to guess, I'd say somewhere around, you know, 22, 23. Last year was supposed to be kind of a smaller class anyway. Um, you can take up to 25 uh, sure. verbal, or, you know, you can actually give out 25 scholarships. So I think that, uh, yeah, you're looking at anywhere between 23 to 25. Unless you're in the SEC and then you can give about 40, I think. Yeah, exactly. But then you're you're anticipating that, you know, half your team is going to make the grades, you know. So, <laughs> and that's and that's another thing is, you know, you got to make sure these kids – Oregon does a great job of, you know, because there's a couple of kids out there that probably should have offers right now from Oregon that don't because of grades. So you ran a, 
a retraction, if you will, the other day on – Yeah, on, on, on Makaya Quick, and, and that's you know another thing that he's a kid that's struggling – or has struggled with grades – uh, I tried to get a comment from him on it. He it was a mix-up of miscommunication between his coach and the Oregon coaches, and then coach told him, "Hey, you got an Oregon offer." Turned out wasn't the case. So uh, that's got to be hard. It, yeah, it is. And I tried to call him and just say, "You know, we're not. You know, we, we, I'm just curious as to you know what you know about the situation or anything like that." And you know, we don't think he he lied to to scouter or E Duck or anything like that because he's he's mentioned it in other interviews. He thought he had an offer. Um, that's turns out he doesn't. That's, that's brutal. A little bit. And he's the top wide receiver prospect by scout um, in, the country. in the country. And that says a lot. Now, again, it's these kids. Uh, Kurt Scobie's another example. Running back. Uh, he's now at his fifth school. I was going to say he's been in about half a dozen, hasn't he? Yeah. And uh, it, 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 he's still searching for that right fit. Uh, I've talked to him a couple times now. And he even he said, you know, this week's testing week, he said, I've, my contact with Oregon – hasn't been as frequent because I've been doing more schoolwork. I've been trying to focus on improving my grades. And the Oregon coaches are big on if we're going to offer you, you better have the grades, um, at least. And that's the track record, at least, from what I've seen. And that's why you don't hear a ton about, you know, at least lately, I did think about Oregon you know, worrying about kids getting in grades. Um, I know there was a little bit of discussion this week uh, on our boards about that. About about Thomas Tyner. About in Thomas particular. Tyner. Yeah, and again, you know, and I, you know, I went to, you know, I got into Oregon. I, you know, and I try to compare. Obviously, I'm not an athlete, but uh, you're not. I, no, I thought <laughs> we talked about that 140 pound frame last <laughs> exactly. week, man. Powerful. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm in sneaky between the strong, tackles, man. runner, man. I'm sneaky strong for 100, you know, 50 pounds, but. At the uh, at the same time, I mean, Oregon, while they have toughened up their academic standards yeah. since 2008, which was when I got accepted, they it's not like they're Washington. It's not like they're Stanford. It's not like they're USC, which USC puzzles me because I'm not sure how you know they they have a very high GPA to get in there, um, and you have to have good test scores and stuff. I'm not sure if the entire football team passes that, but whoa, 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 not, not okay. to take well, a shot at SC. But I think you did just take a shot at SC. Uh, well, yes, subtly, I guess. <laughs> or not that, so subtly. It wasn't very subtle, Robbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry, but it's just it, one of those things where Oregon's not – it's not uh, – they don't have that type of a difficulty uh, getting – Getting these players onto the team, you got to be you got to be smart. You got to be you got to have good grades. You got to have a good at SAT score, but it's not impossible. I think, I think obviously Chip put a big onus on that. I think a hundred percent of student athletes he recruited ended up being academically eligible to play. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was the mark, which is pretty incredible if you think about it over those four years. Well, and it's high. And the, the the teams that you like to see be successful are the teams that also have the kids that are well in the classroom. And you you often saw shots even during the bowl games when they were doing bowl preparation. A lot of photos and stuff you saw were uh, the athletes not practicing. They were doing homework. They had their tutors on the road. They they put an emphasis on schoolwork, and that's an important thing. Um, you know, athletics is is secondary, and it should be in in college, you know, you, you should be wanting to get that degree. And a lot of these kids that you talk to the recruits, they talk about plan B's because for a lot of them, you know, they're not going to be going to the pros at Oregon. You're going to have a better shot, but you got to have that plan B. You should be wanting to focus on your schoolwork. And there are those athletes out there who just don't care. Fine. Um, but when the coaches actually, you know, put their foot down and, you know, put that emphasis on sure. academics. That makes I, I feel like that kind of helps strengthen the team a little bit. You're not putting yourself at a disadvantage because some kid decided he didn't want to go to his history class, didn't take his final. You find out come bowl time. Oh, look, I have you know I don't have so and so now because they didn't go to class or they didn't bother to study. And with Oregon, and especially given the fact that they have that new academic, well, new-ish now, but uh, Jake was Center. the Jaqua Center, uh, specifically for athlete tutoring, mm -hmm. um, it's top of the line facilities. They get tutors. They have, you know, they have a running board of which athletes have tutor sessions where you can actually walk in and see. You know, <laughs> I remember, you know, oh look, Lavazier Tune Tune's got a you know four thirty appointment with you know a math tutor. You could just sit in, couldn't you? Isn't that was that accepted? <laughs> yeah, I wish I would have gotten some more interviews. Yeah. <laughs> But um, but to put that emphasis on academics, I think, is very important and something that more schools need to do and need to keep doing. 
You, you mentioned Kurt Scobie. What's the what's the latest there? He's again a. a He's focused on schoolwork. Oregon, I think, is still interested, but he's even said it himself. He hasn't had a lot of contact with them as of late. So it's hard to say, um, even though he is an Oregon target, and again, it's May. It's extremely early. We're heading into camp season, which is – well, we're already in camp season, but we're heading into more of them, more of the bigger camps where these kids kind of build their stock, um, get an opportunity to raise it, impress some coaches. And uh, he's got some interest from from some good schools, but it's all going to come down to, you know, w- is he going to be able to be academically eligible? I mean, he's a five foot eight, two hundred and fifteen pound running back. He's a tank. He runs solid. He runs through the tackles. I, you know, I like watching his film. But you, you get a sense he's uh, one of Oregon's top targets at running back, which I, I assume Oregon will take a number of running backs this year. Correct? I assume so too. And Oregon's gotten some. You know, you see uh, Demario Richard, uh, uh-huh. Royce Freeman, uh-huh. um, those types Freeman, of players. Freeman, big kid. Freeman's a very big kid. I got a chance to talk to him earlier this week. He said he wants if if he does come to Oregon, he has no problem coming in and carrying the load. He says he knows that they've got they run multiple running backs a game based on the system. But he said. I don't. I don't have a problem being the main guy, and I don't have a problem taking more of the carries um, within that system. Which, again, nice to hear uh, if you're an Oregon fan. Scobie, I think, would be a guy that they really could uh, utilize, just because his size, though, while small, Oregon, that's never been a problem for them. His height's never been a problem, but his his bulkiness. You know that 215 pound frame. Like MJ, tar- yeah, feel like is. MJD. Yeah, and and that's what uh, Brandon Huffman earlier this year kind of classified him as to me was he's he's kind of like Maurice Jones Drew, and I believe that w- you got to wait for the grades to come in. Obviously, it's going to be another sure. probably month or so, but I think when they get the grades, if they see that positive improvement, uh, and him moving to another school, his fifth school, uh, not not a great thing. Again, there's there's been different differing reports it seems about why he's doing this and and i don't want to get too much into that you know the the personal aspect of it but um you know the hope is is that a kid like this um even if it's not oregon that he's able to kind of turn it around in the classroom it sounds like he is he's got a good positive outlook and that you know some school is going to end up with a good running back in kurt scobie whether or not it's oregon i think is going to depend on academics Any, any other outstanding offers this week well, we got uh, – You touched, you touched on a freak. couple of them. Yeah. Um, Talk about Freak. Freak. Uh, he, yeah, we, we touched on him, and uh, I did get to talk to Sam Jones We when we recorded the podcast how, last how week. The, and how was the visit? Good. Um, there was reports that he was going to be – you know, the, the decision was coming soon. Well, then he took his visit to Oregon, and it was it was good. He, he lo- enjoyed it, loved it. Got to see uh, all the facilities. I think got, even got to go into the new football operations building, the the new fancy. He said it doesn't have all the bells and whistles yet, but he says you can see what they're doing. And it will. holy smokes, it's amazing. <laughs> now, interesting thing with Jones was I on the trip he picked up an offer from K State, and so now he's got. He said I'm going to kind of dial it back a little bit. I'm going to now now that I've got another offer because he he really wants to evaluate each school. Um, he's being very, you know, he's getting into it, but it looks like for a while, you know, Arizona State was, and I think still is his favorite, but if things are going to, I think, pick up for him because he said he's going to go to K-State, he's going to make that visit, he's going to evaluate that school, and he told me, he said, look, it's hard for me to put things in order right now because... You, if you if you just automatically say you know such and such was my favorite just because I came off the visit he's like it's just because I came off the visit sure. you know everything looks great the first time you see it he said I got to sit down speak with my family evaluate the pros and cons uh, he seems to be you know doing it the right way uh, again unless I, I think unless Oregon's going to give him a shot at not only like early playing time but the, the tackle. position of one yeah. and and he did say I, I give him credit here he he did say he's open as long as he gets to play he would play guard as well uh, early. Um, he, he would consider doing that, but I think it's really big on whether or not he's where he's going to get to play early, and if he could do that at Oregon, and if Oregon can give him that opportunity and give him a chance to compete for that opportunity, um, they'll have a, a good shot at him. But um, and all it takes is another school saying, "Well, they might give you a shot, but we'll we can already tell you that we think you're going to be starting at us for you know left tackle, right tackle, whatever." And uh, 
that's all sometimes it's going to take to get that kid to commit to your school. We talked about uh, Mahalik obviously committing to Oregon. Another Oregon recruit coming off the board, unfortunately, Christian McCaffrey committing to Stanford. That one was, was, uh, was a recruit I think Oregon really coveted. Not a real big surprise considering his father played uh, for the Cardinal. It's surprising in a sense based off of his style of play. His style of play, it seemed fit Oregon better than it fit Stanford. And my thought with this was Stanford's offensive line, you you can see that's where they've built – that's where Shaw put his focus was, I want to build a big offensive line. He did that. It worked. They had a great season last year. Um, If not for that Notre Dame game, uh, you know, they would have had one loss. So um, so that's a – he – He's done a great job building that up, but Stanford is ground and pound. They recruit, you know, bigger running backs. Toby Gerhardt, uh, you know, Stefan Taylor. Step fan. Uh, those, are, those are the types of backs that you see in that system. You don't see speedy Christian McCaffrey. You don't see a D'Anthony Thomas or a Michael James Maybe. type player in that system. Per- perhaps, pri- a change primarily. Of, perhaps a change of uh, personnel there by Shaw, you think, or just taking th- the best possible prospect, maybe moves him out wide? A little bit of both, I think. I think you want the best possible prospect, but what strikes me is that maybe he the, th- the thought process is, is that you know there's nothing wrong with that and a little bit of speed, a little bit of a dynamic touch to your offense. Uh, their offense is kind of plotting, moves slowly. You know, you, you put a little dash of speed in there, and especially with that offensive line, as long as McCaffrey can hit those, you know, we talked about his outside, his speed to the outside. Sure. Mm-hmm. It All it takes for him then is just to get into the open field. He said he had great field vision. Um, I believe him uh, just watching the tape. He's going to be able to make an impact in that offense because he's going to have the blocking that's going to create the holes for him to get those I, yards. I, I bring that up also because Barry Sanders Jr. figures to be a part of that offense moving forward and another guy like McCaffrey who can yeah. obviously – Move a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. You know, <laughs> him, you know his dad's pedigree. <laughs> look, 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 look at that uh, running back uh, stable of the future. Who would have thought Ed McCaffrey and Barry Sanders kids, potentially the uh, starting running backs at Stanford? I know. You know, and Stanford's kind of becoming was, uh, was Oaks Christian was that high school that got all the celebrity kids. Yeah, and Oregon's, <laughs> Oregon's done a little bit with that as well. You look at Young uh, Dungey, Long, Long, Long. Yeah. Some other names. Yeah, Eric Matthews. Dungey's going to be a kid that I, I'm kind of excited to see if he can do a little bit more this season, too. That's getting a little off topic, but uh, bringing up the name. In, any any other any other thing in recruiting we want to uh, mention? Yeah, one quick thing. Uh, last week, uh, and this is a Northwest prospect. Um, the yeah. only reason I really bring him up, um, Devontae Downs, mm-hmm. um, listed as number one fullback at, in out of Tacoma. At, out of uh, yeah, the, 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 that area, Mount Lake Terrace, yeah. I believe, is uh, the specific area, and uh, has eight Pac-12 offers, both Arizona schools, both Washington schools, Utah, Cal, Stanford, and even the Beavers have I believe he was the him. kid who had uh, like 80, 80 letters from Mike Riley that one day. Did you see that on Twitter? No. He tweeted out, I think he had like 80 letters from, from Mike Riley. That's got to make you feel great. <laughs> Or just or a little overbearing. I don't know. It depends on your perspective, I think. Yeah. Well, it sounds like I mean, he said – I asked him about the recruiting process, and he said it was pretty fun because it's – he's like, yeah, it can get a little bit much. Um, and maybe that's where he was referring to Riley. But he also said it's it's about, um, you know, not – not a, th- this doesn't happen to everybody, yeah, you know. It, yeah. It's it's something you got to take advantage of. But what I find interesting about Downs is it, he's got the size to play running back, and he's got to be a big running back, or he's got the size to play on the other side of the ball at linebacker. And he said it's about seventy thirty the schools that want him at running back. Did you get a feel for where Oregon was on that? He both Oregon schools want him at linebacker. Was he was he down here for the spring game? He was, um, and so he took in that game. He said it was it was a fun experience. He got to talk to Helfrich, got to talk to Aliotti, spent some time with Pelham as well, Coach Don Pelham, linebackers, uh, coach. linebackers coach, and uh, he's he took his visit, said it was fine. He got to go through the you know the, the facilities. He went through the whole gamut, you know, and then it, basically they told him he didn't leave with an offer, but he did say that Pelham told him that you know if or that the school told him you know keep keep at it good things are going to happen. And so he it's a positive sign, and I think with eight Pac-12 offers, and we're going to get a sense farther on down the line with where Oregon's at with how they're recruiting their linebackers. Obviously, they got one already in Jordan Hoyam. Yeah. But I think they're going to visit – you know, he's going to visit the Bay Area schools coming up. We'll see how that goes. And then he's going to be a kid that – it's just someone to keep an eye on. He's a Northwest prospect, good size, six foot three, 215 pounds. 
And I think the fact that Oregon wants him at linebacker, Oregon State wants him at linebacker, but Washington wants him at running back, this kid's a very versatile athlete. So it looks like we're about an hour and four minutes in. Yeah. Well, do we have time to just go through a really brief Let's do some quick recap. uh, recaps. I'm just going to run through Oregon track and field. Yesterday was the Oregon Twilight Meet, which is a fun event. DeAnthony Thomas not participating for the second straight meet. Also does Hmm. not participate in the spring game. Don't know if it's precautionary or how big of an injury he's dealing with, or even if he is dealing with an injury, but obviously something to be aware of for Duck fans. Of course, we still have, as we said, 119 days. It's a lot of time for DeAnthony to heal up. (laughs) And I think it's enough time, but... Uh, something to be aware of. Uh, without him out there, we had a, still had a couple of football players, Dior Mathis and DJ Kelly, per, per, uh, participating in the sprints. Mathis won the uh, 110.7, which I think was the fastest time he ran this year. Kelly at 10.85 was uh, finished second. Uh, Kelly also ran the uh, 221.69, which is good for fourth place. Actually, having watched him, I think the 200 is where he, he fits best. Really? Yeah. He, 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 he's a good, he's a taller guy, long strides, doesn't get out of the blocks particularly quick, but he runs the turn really well. Um, and and the uh, the 200 is actually his third event of the day, so you, you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. I think that time is probably not indicative of what he's capable of, but uh, another guy, obviously, with tremendous speed on the Duck football team. And and uh, the relay team won, and, and I say that because the competition wasn't exactly uh, – Stellar, stellar. Ah, uh, gotcha. It was mostly it was mostly NAIA and community colleges. I think Lane Lane Community College finished third. So ah, good for Lane. Look at that. You got first and third. The Eugene area is just uh, <laughs> excelling in the track field. So so yeah, there's an update there again. I think the big takeaway there is the potential that DeAnthony Thomas is sidelined with some sort of injury. Do you get a feel? Um, uh, I mean, did you get a feel going through spring and all that? I mean, it, that he was participating. Well, not not necessarily participating. Yeah. But, you know, now that we know, you know, he wasn't at the spring game. Sure. Uh, he's been. Well, he was at. He there. was at the game, but didn't play. Didn't play. Um, the, the fact that he wasn't a participant. Do you feel like this is uh, precautionary, or do you feel like maybe there's, there's something, something a little bit deeper there that they're just not saying? About? I, I don't get the. F- I, I mean, again, it's it's hard to say because they are very tight lipped with these these matters but i interviewed him a couple of times towards the end of spring and he didn't didn't say anything that led me to believe he was you know hampered by some serious injury so i i think i i remain i think duck fans should remain cautiously optimistic that this is you know just a precautionary precautionary uh deal here and then they're not trying to uh you know cover up some big injury but um again don't can't say that definitively right the other thing, obviously, we want to talk a little bit of Oregon baseball. Uh, won the first game last night in the series with Washington State. On a little bit of a roll in conference play here. Yeah, and of course, split the series on the road with, with the Seattle uh, Red Hawks, I believe. Yeah, that's a that's always a tricky series. Uh, I remember two years ago, they, they walked out of a game with a tie uh, due to poor field conditions and pouring down rain weather. I think the game ended with the bases loaded. I think they called it. So, and, and so, so it's more than a field condition. Just neither team really cared, right? <laughs> I, I wanted to go home. Hort, Hort, <laughs> Coach Horton wanted to leave. Those bunts weren't rolling on that uh, on that field, probably on the heavy grass. But uh, but it, the I always find the Seattle series intriguing because Seattle seems to play the Ducks somewhat tough. Oregon does seem to get the better of them. The last couple of years they've gone up there, um, but you know, and, and something we should uh, Tolman Mitch. Going, off in this series, he, yeah. nine RBI. I think uh, I think with with Tolman, uh, I think he he's a freshman. Obviously, was a big part of some of that difficulty, if you will, in that UCLA series. Four errors in the first two games, both of which they lost. Mm-hmm. I think there's probably a sense of I got to make up with it, and, and I think where he strives and, and where his strongest part of his game is with his bat. Yeah, uh, I mean, kind of came out of nowhere. Really, wasn't really a, even even really much of an everyday player until midway through or a couple weeks into conference play, and is now I think leading the team in 
batting average. So well, and you see a different guys step up on uh, on this team. I remember last year Scott Heineman went down uh, after yeah. you know he had a foot injury that uh, kept him out the entire season. Uh, he was strong at third base, and then Ryan Hambright stepped up out of nowhere, and uh, he became a very he became a key contributor, very clutch contributor towards the end of the season, especially come playoff time. And now Hambright also hampered with an injury and has not. That's played a in a very long time. Yeah, we've seen Tolman over at third. Yeah, for the last uh, couple months. Yeah, and so they're now now that they're you know they go two and one on the week. So Oregon baseball, I think they're sitting at like thirty five, seventeen, something like that, or maybe maybe a few more wins. There. I don't get too excited about the non conference record. Right. It's all about it's all about the uh, the Pac twelve race. Oregon and Oregon State still remained. I'm going to say tied. Yeah. I think there's a half game lead for Oregon State just because they haven't played as many games, but and that'll even out here in the next couple weeks. Well, actually, next week when Oregon plays a non-conference series in Columbus against the Buckeyes. See, and that's one that I found when I looked at the schedule was going to be very intriguing because it's not often you see Oregon. I mean, Oregon does go back east. It seems once a year. I mean, they went to Vanderbilt. Uh, was it last year? I believe. I believe, yeah. And yeah, uh, last year. and they, you know, they they do tend to take one long trip, and I, I found. Ohio State to be interesting, uh, an interesting choice, I guess, especially that late in the season, that you're you're you know kind of trying to pay attention to the conference race. And I know they they try to stay away from the headlines. They do a good job. Horton's done a great job of of either coaching kids to say or at least making them not look at the papers. Because yeah. last year, you know, you ask them, you know, what do you think about you know being this close to you know Arizona and Oregon State or nipping at your heels coming into the final week of the season? Oh, we don't look at the papers. Oh, I didn't even know we had that record. I didn't. <laughs> it was a lot of that, and so I, I, I imagine it's the same this year. I'm imagining they're going to handle it business as usual, even if they're going you know night you know almost all the way across the country with two weeks left to go in the regular season. Um, and it's going to be nice the fact that it's not going to impact the conference record. I'll be interested to see, and I'm assuming this will be the case, but uh, what they decide to do in terms of the pitching rotation over that weekend, do they give their guys a little bit of a rest, or do they want to keep their guys, you know, Maybe do the and, midweek rotation like they do, you know, like Seattle, for example, you know, throw, just, throw maybe, a lot maybe, of maybe throw guys. The, or, or throw the guys in a pitch count, you know, maybe an 80-pitch pitch count. Don't throw them too much. Make sure they're getting their arms, you know, keeping their arms warm for the weekend. I don't know. Throw them three, four innings something, and then switch like them out that, something like go, that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, obviously, you, you want to win every game, but. <clears throat> At a certain extent, uh, some games are more valuable than others. And yep. obviously the, the series following that, which is the Oregon State series, in Eugene, which is the big series for the conference race, is, is the one with the most value at this point. Oh, yeah. And that's going to be – I'm looking forward to catching a little bit of that series, hopefully get down to Eugene, check it out. Um, real quick before we wrap it up, Ducks did win last night 5-3. to three, That's correct. Uh, one in, in the uh, ninth yep. on a right run ninth. hit. So uh, a big – Big win for the Ducks. They're keeping their role going uh, up there in Pullman. They play again today. Actually, they're playing it's probably fifty-one right in, now. They're playing in nine minutes, but so but when, by the time this podcast comes up, the game may already be over. Right. So we'll we'll run two separate endings with the Ducks won, the Ducks lost. No, no, we won't do that. But uh, good to see the Ducks baseball team on a roll. Good to see track uh, continuing their success. Um, looks like it's going to go down to a, a very strong. Finish I should, for I, the Oregon, I should say, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, the Oregon track, they do run the uh, Pac-12 track meet down in Los Angeles, USC, hosting this year. Oregon figures to compete at a very high level and more than likely, I should say, win both the men and women's crown. Before we go, I do want to do a brief Twitter shout-out here, uh, just in case any of you guys are out there tweeting and looking to, for some people to follow. Uh, I am Eric underscore Scopel on Twitter and Robbie is at R Boydston underscore Educk. The Educk official Twitter is at Scout Oregon. Yes. So, and uh, my last name is tricky to spell. So As is mine, but should yeah. we just let him guess? But Yeah, take a wild guess at it. I don't think there's too many Robbie Boydstons running around uh, So if we Scout, want, do, so. Me, do you want me to spell these out or are we just going to send off? Uh, no, we'll, 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 let's see if they can. Let's, see let's give them a challenge, and, yeah. and, and we'll see how That's many fo- how week. many how many followers we actually get out of this shout out. <laughs> how many of you guys even listened this far in? We are about an hour and fourteen minutes in, so we're a talky bunch. We are a talky bunch. So, uh, for Robbie Boyce, this is Eric Scopel, Edec Podcast. Once again, I want to give thanks to uh, Mario Gadini and Major Oni for this sweet uh, beats that are playing right about now. Mm-hmm.